Okay, so we will start the lecture once recording starts. <clears throat> so far we have covered the ground, uh, I think, which is sufficient for you to now, uh, you know, be self-dependent and start exploring the cloud further. We have got discussed about the tools and uh, command line interfaces, uh, ideas. Now we will come to more um, align to what do you say the development software development related to cloud okay uh, so far we have been talking generically but um, as you would imagine software development against cloud and their deployment of the software to the cloud they are both important things and the de deployment part is uh, you know part of devops major part of devops so we discussed about that but you need to design and architect the software considering the cloud in mind when you take decisions what kind of deployment what kind of architecture you are going to build so on the cloud uh, for the application to be deployed on the cloud there are different architectures uh, recommended architectures and uh, we will discuss that those things so that is what uh, our um, next few lectures we will will talk about so what are the cloud architecture so why there is a difference between cloud architecture and uh, regular architectures right uh, regular architectures what we really we really start from regular architectures if you uh, if you see the first architecture we study is anterior architecture. Okay, um, have has anyone heard about anterior architecture ever? What is an anterior design or architecture? Anyone? You, haven't, you don't know what is anterior architecture? No, sir. Okay, no problem. That's okay. So. Okay, so I'll like take it, we'll go a step back then. <clears throat> anterior architecture is actually um, easy to follow. So most of the um, traditional applications, okay, so anterior architecture. So in, in a traditional sense, and, and why it is coming into picture here is because when the cloud started we had a lot of applications already architected and architected right and many of them moved to cloud and uh, so the cloud providers will try to give you a similar running environment so that you can move the application as it is to the cloud right so that is why they gave an they they gave a migration path from traditional uh, anterior architecture to cloud anterior architecture. Okay, so now before we discuss about what is an cloud archi anterior architecture, we need to know what is anterior architecture in general. Anterior tier means layer, right? So it is layer layered architecture. So what it says is basically, let's say suppose uh, I want to um, create a website or let, let's say some functionality website. E-commerce is an easy example to discuss. E-commerce uh, website I want to create. Okay, website. So for the, for the user who is sitting on its uh, uh, computer, it will simply display a web page, right? A web page with some uh, this thing account information will come here if then some product details right like that it will come here some uh, um, other stuff some part of advertisements like that it will be a typical typical website that we want to build now this is on the client side right so as you would imagine this is a web page and web page how does when the user opens uh, www.amazon.com or .in how does this web page show up here it 
it is not lying on the computer because you and me on our different computers go to amazon dot in and we see the same page right so somebody up there is sending that information to the browser right so it is called serving the pages so here on the on the server side in the in the traditional or cloud sense it's the same thing somebody is sending a request when i type the website name so i am sending a rest request rest call right which is basically http protocol request okay uh, rest is representational state transfer something like that what it basically says is it basically is a request to the server now this server guy there is a server here or uh, you can say uh, infrastructure or software right which is basically called in in together web server so there is a web server which means it has a machine vm or real machine software it will have underlying web server general web server like iis internet information server or apache server right it will be let me draw it here the underlying apache server will be there or iis right it is generic web server on and top of it our web app will be deployed right so what the role of the uh, apache server is it receives the request on our behalf and when the url matches it will call the controller or main some function code of this app which will start running in response to the rest call so in this response when we return we return a page let's say it is home page call so we'll say it is serve this uh, html page return home.html so apache server will return in response home dot html plus the uh, css files for styling plus the javascript files for some other work right javascript does manipulate the html <clears throat> so like that this whole package will come obviously not everything needs to come again and again some javascript library let's say if jquery is being used then it will come only once and then rest of the time it will not come but that is the detail but generally whenever we make a uh, http call there is a response to that and what is that http call the response will depend on that when i said amazon dot in it is a uh, <clears throat> call to the to the home page to the index page of the application so that is how the response comes back the browser on this side will know how to render the html using javascript and css right so it will show the page to us <clears throat> and there are many more details like you can get you can update portions of the page automatically using uh, ajax calls and stuff but what we are interested in is that how this thing how this thing is can be expanded this is this single uh, kind of uh, way of working is fine for a small small application like static website but what if there is a lot of processing that needs to be done what if there is some background process has to be done what if there is a database that is that has to be involved for storing registering the user um their search result finding the search result that is for processing part making purchases and showing the history of the orders for a particular user letting letting them log in and stuff right so <clears throat> where do we keep all that database is the database uh, attached to this server directly here or uh, where does the search happen is it uh, happening here so that those questions have uh, you know been answered mostly uh, in the traditional uh, architectures because we we said this is a traditional architecture right so what happens is we we get a quite complicated system here why because this this guy needs to serve the page request that is one thing right then you have to process the data also right then you have some security issues also then you have got some db things also 
a lot of things that needs to go on then you have to probably also take uh, integrate with the third party um, things like for example payment gateways right <clears throat> so there are so many things that the server needs to do browser has just one job just serve or show the page on the client side so the complexity is completely on the server side not that the client side doesn't have challenges but we are right now talking about the server side and obviously bulk of the functionality or complexity lies still lies on the server side the npr architecture kind of gives you a guidance architecture is like uh, how it all is built up so what it says is you build your application in tiers in layers okay so generally it started with three tier architecture one first tier will be uh, the web uh, uh, web request handlers you can say okay second tier will be business logic and third tier will be database layer okay web handle basically it will comprise of the controllers which receive the request for receiving and response receiving through the web server okay then the business logic should be independent of who is sending the request the business logic is only business logic right no uh, what do you say platform or web specific code so business logic should not know whether the request is coming through a internet or it is running on a desktop application so, uh, basically it should be only business logic uh, logic only business logic right so for example um, what running your search algorithm against the database that will be same uh, even if you are deploying it on a desktop or a, or or a running a web server right um, letting your customer login will still be the same uh, thing right nothing to do much with the web then the database layer will handle the details of the database so obviously the crud operations basically right crud means create read update delete crud in short right so crud operations of the database so like that it is three tier architecture right <clears throat> then um, it further is in, in like as the time progresses or if your application becomes more and more complex you can add more layers to this application for example you can have um web request handler then you can have a services layer in between which basically can integrate uh, with business logic can integrate with some third party applications because you might get some information from outside of your system right then you can have a, a database layer which in itself could include some framework which which make it easier for a uh, business layer to connect with the database layer like that you can have four layer architecture also you can probably you, uh, if required you can have some um ssl or encryption decryption layer right which can encrypt or decrypt the request before it goes rest to the rest of the system so as you can see it can from three generic layers it could go to four five six like that so that is why it is called n n tier you can have n tier n layers for this kind of architecture so it nicely um you know separates the concern now what there are some rules for example the top layer should only know about the lower layer lower one okay so it means this doesn't know about the top layer okay this has only top layer has a direct reference to the lower layer this is the reference uh, if you would have if you have studied about object oriented programming so you have this tight coupling between top layer and lower layer 
but lower layer should not have any reference no top layer reference right that 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 is why it should be tiered it is lower layer uh, or it, we can say lower layer can uh, top layer can or upper layer uh, actually upper is better word upper layer can talk to lower layer when i say talk to lower layer technically it means it has a reference of lower layer right but lower layer cannot directly talk to the uh, upper layer this directly talk is not allowed okay then the question comes how then a lower layer will send back the data to the upper layer right so those questions are answered when you study object oriented programming and i know uh unfortunately this brings to my uh, one point i i was thinking yesterday i know that object oriented programming has been taken off from uh, btech course curriculum <clears throat> and as you know i uh, get btech people for doing projects with me on uh, during btp summer internship and sometimes they are required to know object oriented programming because live projects object oriented programming is still the rule of the world and they have no clue of what what object oriented programming is sometimes interviews are taken and they don't they don't uh, you know the candidate is not my student is not still uh, capable of working on a live project but because he doesn't understand object oriented concepts so in my opinion object oriented programming should be part of the core course but i don't make the rules here uh, what um uh, is taught in object oriented programming is such things only how the upper layers can talk to lower uh, how the lower layers in what ways lower layers can talk to upper layers through event handlers through callback mechanisms and stuff like that right um but anyway so this is one rule then another rule is that the uh, upper layer need not to talk this rule is not always the hard and fast rule sometimes you need to have exceptions but generally the, the 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 you should not the upper layer should not skip a layer to talk directly to the lower layer okay this generally should be avoided okay things like that so there are rules so that rules make an architecture that okay this is the recommended way this is the uh, rules and that becomes our architecture this is the entire architecture now the coming back to the cloud side now when i am a, if i am a cloud provider i know that my application is split into these layers my in the sense my customers application most of uh, my guys or whom i am targeting my customer base are software companies right because they need to move their stuff on my cloud that is what i as an azure or microsoft or uh, amazon is looking at right so um what should i do right what should be my business logic business thing that it, it could i can what what should i do that it can bring that application as it is almost as it is to my cloud right but that is the right thing to do uh, uh, rather than telling them oh you need to change this architecture to something else and then move to cloud that never going to happen right so the migration part that i drew somewhere here this migration part should be as easy as possible so therefore there is a recommended architecture on the cloud that is also an tier architecture that means it is an architecture <clears throat> it is an ias server ias service infrastructure as a service what cloud uh, cloud providers give you is that you can create vms or ec2 instances right but there is a uh, recommendation that you, if you have bunch of vms fine you can create some database on that but how do you map or how do you migrate your application or how do you migrate your entire architecture in which your application is built onto those set of vms right and not only vms then what else you need to do 
that all is what clouds and tier architecture talks about okay and it is an is is uh, service because other architectures go to a mostly pass uh, level and the primary reason like i said why it is is because technically the only contribution of the cloud is that it will provide you the vms in a loose sense right it will provide you a lot of other things like network um, groups security groups for example or virtual networks those things given but the key thing is it will provide you a bunch of vms then it is up to you right that software company how to use it so now obviously the guys who built the cloud know the cloud the best right so they come up with recommended ways of doing things so they know that my customer potential customer is going to migrate its uh entered entire architectured application to these set of vms that they are provisioning so i will guide them so that it will help them right so that is the uh, idea behind this entire architecture um guidance uh, what 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 how it should look like right so this one is more like a traditional uh, layered architecture right then we have got another one. now from here onwards so this one is traditional but from second and so on we have got we can call them like kind of a cloud specific uh, architectures okay cloud specific architectures which are after you move to a uh, cloud they are you can opt for a better way of doing things depending upon the requirements of your application right so when i was working in microsoft we had a tool uh one service uh os one service estimator meaning we had we created a tool which will help the field people estimate the projects based on various parameters uh when they will build it build for some client side right? so microsoft also has a services division like infosys or tc uh, tcs these guys have don't have much of their products they serve people right they have clients who who they go to and then propose that this is what we will do for you if you want to do this project and then the, the client will award them the project there is a microsoft global services division gsd uh m mgsd is there so they do the same thing so obviously you can imagine that there are large clients that uh, get the services done from microsoft so if, how do you provide the estimate right so we we we, we built a excel based tool which was integrated with the cloud this this whole tool was called osc one services estimator so we uh, it was running on on uh, traditional servers first right it was an entire architecture but we moved it to, we had to move it to the cloud so we moved it as it is first to the cloud using ias right using this traditional entire architecture then we moved it to a pass layer not uh, really microservice based we uh, kind of a web query queue worker architecture and then then we uh, would we were designing to move it to microservice based architecture before i left so i hope they would have moved it but uh so what i am trying to tell you is practically also this is the general path if you want to migrate application from your traditional servers to uh, cloud you migrate it as it is to cloud using vms right ias now what you have got the advantage now you are you don't need to worry about your hardware right? you just tell them dispose whatever done the hardware responsibility becomes microsoft's responsibility right but you have to make sure your vms are set up properly they the internet the uh, web servers are installed properly the databases are installed properly all that you need to take care of azure or aws will make sure the network is fine the vms are working and stuff right next step comes when it becomes stable next step is now how can i get rid of vms i don't want to even be responsible for vm so the migration uh, is from ias to the pass 
layer. So how can I uh, use now or move to from IS layer to the pass layer? That is the next step in in the migration. And why I'm telling you and sharing you my experience also with you, never try to migrate an application from traditional servers to cloud directly to pass. It will bring chaos. It is as simple as that, right? So there should always be a step-by-step -step approach, which generally first you migrate through IES and then pass. Therefore, it is important to know how even a traditional anti-architecture architecture can be done on the cloud. Because you might think that why traditional architecture should be there in the cloud. Right? This is the reason. Because most applications move first to anti architecture. Then not only that you need to know, you need to know which of these, these architectures uh, need to be built or chosen when you move to the pass layer. So these are all pass architectures, right? So it's uh, very important to know about these architectures. Any questions in the general idea of NTR? What is NTR and uh, uh, why we are studying about it? Any, um, any questions before we move further? Have you got what is NTR architecture now? Any question, guys? No? Anyone? Any questions? Okay, cool. Then we'll move further. So these are the architecture we'll study. We will definitely, obviously, study NTR architecture. We will study WebQ. We will definitely study microservices. Then these two architectures depends upon how much availability of time we have got. Uh, we will do some parts of this uh, PubSub model stuff like that. But big data, most likely not, because we don't have infra and stuff for big data compute. But we might touch upon these things. These three definitely will work, and some portion of this, uh, I think, if you will understand all these uh, architectures, it will be a uh, great uh, achievement because this is what you are going to be asked about in the interview. Okay, so let us discuss the entire architecture style. Now, I, as I told you, there are um, there is an architecture style and Architecture style is generic, right? Or what is the architecture? It is generic now. Then you need to implement, right? So you need to really implement into when you become when you come to implement it, you have to choose your cloud like Azure versus AWS, right? Then you need to get into their jargon of creating VMs, for example, or here EC2 instances, for example, and bunch of other stuff which basically maps to the architecture or adheres to the architecture, but it has to come into these two kind of uh, implementation worlds, right? So we have a generic view of the architecture, and then we will discuss how this architecture is actually realized in Azure, for example, right? So that is what uh, these, uh, the, the few next few things we are talking to talk about. So NTR architecture divides the application into logical layers and physical layers, right? Physical tiers. So we have discussed that earlier. We uh, distributed or divided the application into logical layers in our discussion. And when you implement those logical layers, let me a little bit talk about that also. So we said these layers right now. Now let me draw it here. What it says is logical and physical, right? That's what it's talking about. So suppose we decide that this is our four layer architecture. Last one is ZB layer, right? This is um, business logic. This is services. And this is our web interface. Not user interface, web, web interface, the API, right? That REST call API. REST interface. So how do you how do you actually realize it or deploy it? Right? So you will need some VMs 
which will run this web api vm1 vm2 it will it will receive the request so here these vms will be special because you will run some web servers on them right similarly database you will have again vms one or more vms they are special because they will have some dbs installed on the top of them right so this is how you realize the different layers business logic may have different uh, uh, machines with more compute power for example because they need to run the cpu for processing it right uh, services layer maybe they talk to the third party so then their io should be fast or something like that right db vms io should be fast like that so you need to realize this architecture this is the logical architecture logical layers into the real physical layers right so that is also part of architecture because this is just the theory part this one is just theory this is the real deployment so that's why it is saying the entire architecture divides application to logical layers and then how to do with what to do with the physical layer right layers are the, are a way to separate responsibilities right and manage the dependencies so layering obviously is for responsibility and dependency management right because uh, if we keep things separate that is one of the primary principles of object oriented programming that is called separation of concerns soc separation of concerns is basically separate the responsibility and therefore we can manage the dependencies if we can manage the dependencies we can handle the complexity that is involved right it's inherently complex systems so we can manage them through layered architecture so there is a client right and client wants to talk this is the computer that i would i drew on the client side it wants to talk about uh, talk to the web server so here so this is the internet right this is client side and this rest of the whole thing is server side or on the cloud right so this this is internet in between internet is there okay. so this this is not like client is lying close to this so this uh, in the client request comes through the firewall now uh, sorry come through comes through the internet so we have a firewall uh, web application firewall which provides a security layer right and then it very validates the uh, incoming uh, request in the sense that from um, allowed or not allowed kind of uh, filtering and then it sends the request to the web tier right web tier basically then um, is the receiver of the application it knows what to do with that application for example it validates the parameters that are passed in could be right it it could uh, basic validation it could be responsible for decrypting the data it could be responsible for uh, sending the response, response that comes back from this rest of the system right so web tier has its responsibilities then web tier might send message to the business logic this is the middle tier that is middle, middle um, business logic okay and then it could also send a uh, set a message in a queue message queue because sometimes you may not you know immediately uh, be able to handle the request you set it in the message queue and let the middle tier handle it right and then the client waits for the client no need not to wait for the response it can do something else when the message gets handled the response is sent back using the ajax call that is what the asynchronous uh, calls is all about using uh, promises in in javascript or uh, um, such uh, languages you know, on the client side when the when the asynchronous response comes your code starts running on the client side right so that is because web tier put some thing in the message queue which got handled and then it came back so the request control comes in business logic through messaging or all uh, or the direct uh, from the web tier calling okay and then middle tier can connect to the business logic can connect to the remote services it could connect to the data tier as we talked about right there could be a cache 
that will not require data access because data access is costly in terms of time and resources okay um so we could we could have a cache in between okay and then uh, better the performance so the importance of cache is that i worked on one project from uh, aditya bill health insurance they are they have a web application called active days so that is for their customers to uh, install their the people who have bought their insurance and then you can do your physical activities like running jogging stuff and it will keep recording the activities that you do the more active so there is a threshold of number of steps you need to take take i think 10000 if you cross that step in a day you get a active day so that active day you bunch of active days can give you some discount in insurance premium that you pay the basic idea is that if you keep your people healthy the insurance company benefits because there will be lesser claims right so they they had awful performance issues their app would like uh, was not very doing very well so we like i led the team where we implemented such a solution they they don't have didn't have a cache so we implemented a cache and it worked quite well there afterwards right so cache is very very important is practical not we don't generally think about it when we do hello world applications or our uh, uh, college projects but having a cache system is very important consideration in any any system i agree it need not to be the first one you get the things done first correctly because caching is more about performance if your system is incorrect performance doesn't really matter so first build a correct system then come to the performance right <clears throat> you can build a testing layer or test infrastructure based on correctness of the application then you can do whatever you want to do to, to enhance the performance because now you have that testing infrastructure available who can test for the correctness of the system despite uh, i mean after you make changes to for for battering the performance that could lead to some bugs right so your testing can catch those bugs so this is always that way you build a system test it out keep those tests with you make them automated once the system is declared correct then you come to the performance had a hard look at what you have done introduce caching introduce some changes in even even database uh, optimization uh, table table optimization shouldn't have many joins things like that do whatever you like but now you have the backup or the shield provided by the testing layer to you that i did some change i can run the test if test pass i am pretty confident that the system will work right so that way the caching should be afterwards but it is an important part so at at the end goal or it is a good um or genuine component in the entire architecture even if even if this need not to be here all the time okay then we have this uh, third party and data tier so this is basically our entire architecture where we have this kind of a, a tier 1 which receives the request then we have got this tier 2 which processes the request and tier 3 caching include kind of uh, cache is basically in memory database right so it will come in the database layer so like that you have different tiers of the uh, architecture right so this maps to what we discussed in our general entire introduction so it maps to that now how do we realize this in in azure for example that that is taking guidance from this setup what we need to do when we have got entire architecture to be implemented in in azure right okay before that i think let us discuss if something is left uh when to use this architecture typically implemented as is with with each tier running on the separate set of vms so this i have already talked about consider entire architecture for simple web applications okay this is the most important thing migrating an on premises application to azure with minimal refactoring right this is the key this is the key reason second one is the key reason why 
there is a NTR architecture guidance for cloud because of minimal refactoring required to migrate your existing application. Right? This gives you a great example of prioritization in your work. Right? The people in Azure or, or AWS, they will say, what is it that I can, what is it I can do or what kind of services I can provide, which can start giving me return on my investment, right? That means I can, pro I need to provide a way for on-premises application to come to Azure with minimal refactoring. They will come quickly if I can provide them a way to do it through minimal changes, right? That is, this is. You provide with IS kind of services and and the architecture guidance so that minimal refactoring is, is done in the code and your application can move to Azure. Right? That is how you should always work. What is the MVA? What is the minimal viable product? What is the minimum thing that I need to put in my application? Let's say if you have got a mobile app idea, right? We every day new ideas will spring up in our minds. When you want to implement it, there are hundreds of things that you could do, right? Pick up the top two or three things, even one thing is fine. What is the minimal viable product? Minimum viable product, meaning whatever the, the key thing that you can do that is minimalistic, but it is still viable. It will still be called a scenario implemented or a feature in the product that the people can start using it, right? Product means you people are using, it is used for the people, right? So we end up like writing this in my application and nothing gets shipped. So we should learn from this reason of why, um, this architecture is there to move to help Azure uh, get customers with minimal refactoring so that they can migrate their on premises applications to Azure. Right? Then you can also have unified development of on premises and cloud applications. Why is that? So, this is also important to consider that gives you a very nice option, uh, which that some of the VMs you are having on the cloud, let's say. VM1, VM2, VM3, okay? But there is a hard requirement. This is cloud and this is my on-premises thing. That my database layer has to be lying on my in-house server, right? Database uh, server one, DB server two, like that, right? If such is the requirement, then I set up this entire architecture, few layers, except the database layer here, few layers I can set up here, right? And can through VPN or through network, I can talk to my database, right? So you can have, this is your hybrid setup. Hybrid means some portion is in the cloud, some portion is in the on-premises. This is also a very important scenario in terms of uh, cloud business because we talked about my migrating the whole application to the cloud but it may not be possible all the time to migrate whole application it may not be uh, compliant if we migrate the whole application to the cloud maybe the compliance issues say that the data has to be within the bank premises right or or some entities premises geographic boundary or it has to be kept it is all mostly about data. So it might be that your data is lying in on-premises server, but rest of the system you can move on to the cloud. And it will still give you benefits. So that is the hybrid scenario. So anti architecture can help you with hybrid scenarios. Other architectures can also help you. Uh, but if you want to uh, develop both on-premises and cloud applications together, anti architecture might suit it. Okay. Uh, what are the best practices? Use auto scaling to handle changes in load. These, these I, am, I have given link. This is for further study that what you should do to uh, you know increase the usability or 
performance of your entire architecture. Caching should be done, for example, right? Messaging should be asynchronous. You should have auto scaling that increase or decrease in the load will auto scale the VMs like that. At SQL Server, they, you put a always on availability groups. You divide the servers into two, so link them together using SQL Server always on technology, and it will link up and be like two nodes of a single database like that. Then you put uh, application firewalls in the front end and the internet for the security purpose, right? Place each tier in its own subnet and use subnets to as a security boundary. So each tier that we talk about, they should have its own subnet. The people who want to do networking on this will know subnets. And so the VMs will be in one part part of the network address, right? That subnet. And then subnet can be used as a security boundary for that particular layer. Okay. Uh, restrict the data layer tier by allowing requests only from the middle, middle tiers. Meaning, uh, how do you implement this idea that in the traditional architecture, this this is not allowed, for example, right? This thing, this thing is not allowed. Uh, only lower layer can talk about it, right? How do you implement those things? So those are the best practices. But how do you really realize this architecture in Azure on virtual machines? So this is how it is done. So here you're on the left side, the client is there, right? Client will send a request. This load balancer is basically a, uh, I have, I think given you assignment also about load balancer, right? It basically is this table. It's a hardware kind of a uh, component, which come from the left side, the request will come. It will send the request to any of the VMs that are on that in its table. So it is a one to multi VM mapping. And it will, it will have responsibilities like it will make sure it will check whether the VMs are available uh, live or not, right? It has not gone down. It will distribute the request kind of a round, round robin fashion. If first request comes here, second will go to the next, third will go to the next, and then again to the first like that. So two, three responsibilities it has. It's a very simple um, piece of hardware with some programmability, and uh, it will distribute the load basically, right? So if you have multiple VMs, then uh, we have got, uh, we need to, these VMs need to be utilized, right? Somebody needs to distribute the request between them. That's the job of load balancer. So load balancer receives the request from internet, sends this to the, uh, the this is like a security security layer. What was the NVA? Network virtual appliances, right? So there is a term you can see the notes. Uh, by the way, you should check the notes also in my in my slides. Somewhere you might find links and like this, right? So this, this is kind of a firewall, okay? And uh, it is called network virtual appliances, NVAs, that implement security functionality such as firewall and packet inspection. And it, there's a lot more detail uh, about the the architecture of the NVAs them, themselves. But basically it is it is mapping to this uh, firewall layer. Okay. Now this firewall layer takes care of the security part, right? Whether the request is genuine or not, genuine or not um, it might decrypt the message because I don't have any other thing. Everything else is within my network only, so I don't need to percolate that encrypted message all through my layers, right? So it can do a lot of things, pack, packet inspection and stuff. Then we have got this web tier. Web tier has got multiple VMs, and a load balancer will help us distribute the request to the web tier. Then we have got business tier, which has got VMs. It will, again, have load balancer and distribute the request. And then we have got this data tier where we install SQL Server for uh, this thing. And 
they it one is the primary node one is the secondary installation and whole thing is part of a single virtual network okay so you'll create a virtual network within this this is one subnet of this virtual network this vn so this subnet is of part of the vn right and this is another subnet and this is another subnet so what you can and and so is this so what you can do in your setup is say that now these these are vms right this is this is this is going to have ip addresses so ip1 ip2 ip3 right uh, let's say bip1 uh, bip1 bip2 and bip3 like that right so i can configure my data to the load balancer that the incoming request should be in its table one table will be that a request comes uh, sorry one table will be a list of a list of vms on this side right so it will be two vms sql server 1 sql server 2 right but on the other list it will have a checklist there bip1 bip2 and bip3 will be there right so when this load balancer receives a request it will check whether this request has come from either any of these ip addresses if it has come then only it will pass it let it go through right then if somebody doesn't know or some other reason somebody tries to access from this layer directly the database layer that will not be allowed because the load balancer will not allow it because the incoming request is not from the given ip addresses that are part of that that list right so that is the idea behind what when when it was saying restrict access to the data tier by allowing request only from middle tier right this is the uh, restriction of access through subnets okay so those are the things that you need to do to set it up as a Uh, to realize the anti error architecture on virtual machines okay um then what is about this this part what is devops azure portal bastion what is this bastion thing okay so you need somebody to be able to manage this right who will configure the load balancers right who will uh, install or uh, upgrade the os on these vms because these are ies right other than providing us the machines everything else is our responsibility right? who will uh, deploy the web new updates into the business tier or the whole application right who will take backup so the sql server or can can inspect or something uh, about the sql servers if required right who will generate the reports and all so you need some access to this whole network which is different from the regular internet access right so that is your devops devops portal you can go to portal devops thing you can go to portal you can even run the scripts etc and log into a bastion vm meaning it's a developer vm or or devops vm which will which is in the same virtual network the key is that is in the same virtual network when it is in the same virtual network you can access this without having to go out of the uh network boundary of that setup right your your virtual network it your ip address range is of this bastion machine is within this virtual network so it can allow access to all vms so for example these load balancers will have entry of this ip address in the vms as well okay and by the way when you create a virtual machine its ip address is not fixed okay you need to if you want for example if such a setup you have done in the load balancer that my request to business tier can only come from ip1 ip2 and ip3 
right? That that will be hard coded values. So you will deploy the application, and after some days, it just stops working. Even after you restart your VMs, even after everything works fine, it still doesn't let the uh, messages go from business tier to web tier. Load balancer is not able to send the messages to the web tier. Why? Because this list that you put in the uh, load balancer is a hard coded list, and due to one restart or other, every time you are restarting, the IP address of your machines is changing. So either you update the load balancer every time. or you have something called static ip address which will not change it will always be same next time onwards also so that that also uh, sometimes i mean knowing about that is also important for example if you go to virtual machines that we have got uh networking sorry yeah we can so this is the ip address right of this machine that is there if i go to the ip address it can tell me um uh, where is it i think it's in the overview only it comes ip address there is some place where it shows it is static or not ah here so it's a dynamic ip address as you can see a dynamic means it will change every time it might change every time it restarts uh, the vm gets restarted right if i want to keep the ip address same then i should opt for this static option right the existing ip address will up be updated when changing the allocation type or some other ip address change it might other uh, actions might lead to ip address change so it is not it is advisable to change it to static if you need a static ip address okay uh, so for example this vm i have shared it to one of my students that she can use this vm for her work and when you connect it gives you it gives you a rdp file a more desktop file right which will basically have this ip address it's simply a text file with with some command and ip address now i have shared that uh, file with her when after downloading that you can use this rdp file double click on the rdp file it will connect but when somehow if this vm restarts this ip address is not static right it will it will change like as you can see and that rds uh, rdp file that i shared with her is not going to work anymore because next time this ip address will be different so she will get trouble in uh, logging into that machine and she will ping me uh, i am not able to log into the vm that you provided me because that ip address got changed so i should opt for static address right so static address might lead to restart but that's fine so i should take it the static address most of the time it does not restart let's see uh what happened can't be updated because it's actually to the rdp configuration then i put into this i think it yeah so basically it updated the ip address now if i go back to this vm like this ip address as you can see it is now static right so now there is that problem problem will not come it will always reboot with the same ip address so that is the idea behind static ip address and it can help you uh, knowing what that can help you now what should be the question here anyone there should be one question here a very common question not related to ip addresses but a general question that i told you to always keep in mind what is it in cloud computing what is the most important thing that you need to keep in mind 
what is it come on price yes cost right price so the question is i want to dynamic ip address my uh, service or provider like azure provides me by default when i move to static the basic everything that you do in cloud right the first question should come is what is going to cost me so the question should be sir i change it to static is there any cost implications for that any action on in cloud you should first question you should ask is what is the cost implication right so there is a cost implication because azure is doing something more than just providing you an ip address right it has to reserve its uh, ip address somewhere it cannot be allocated so it 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 has some work to do so they will cost you even though very small amount but it still costs money to have a static address okay so be aware of that it costs money how much uh, you should check it out and let me know also i have not i don't know what is the amount but i know for sure that if you put static address it will cost you a little bit more than not putting static address so there is a cost implication um you should definitely check it out okay so uh yeah so we were talking about the ip address came into picture so this is the bashing vm so is there anything else we have not talked about virtual network portal devops guy dmz dmz is actually a short form of dematerialized zone militarized zone so basically it's a security boundary you can say right web tier business tier data tier so all we have talked about primary secondary it could be one server as a primary node and secondary is only serving is getting synced up from the primary and it it can be used only if required uh generally the request will go to the primary but this load balancer will send it to both so in in a way it this in my opinion this secondary one should be either not connected to the load balancer it should come here right uh and we need to update it only when secondary server uh or if the primary goes down or if we can ensure that these two guys are always in sync then it is fine right? because um if it is not in sync we may not get the recent data from secondary the latest data from secondary thing so that is one thing i noticed okay let's go through the notes so that we don't miss anything each tier consists of two or more vms ah we need to place them in availability set right so that we forgot to discuss so each tier you will put in a in an availability set right so as we discussed in our availability set example bottom line is same role machines in same availability set right not like this not horizontally but like vertically same role machines in same availability set as the first point uh um, there is some skill set or service also that has come so you should check it out what is the skill set what it's similar to availability set skill set will be how to how the vms are used as the requirement increases multiple vms provide resiliency in case one vm fails so the question could be sir why three vms why not four why not two why not one so we already know the answer two only at least two will lead to uh, being in availability set and sla holding the more you have the closer you will get to the 100% right so it will be balanced between how much you can spend how much is the availability load balancers are used to distribute the request across the vms in a tier so that we know a tier can be scaled horizontally by adding more vms to the pool so this is very important how we scale it right so if you see that you start with two vms but how do you add a new vm to this so that is important thing but i guess not so difficult because you can if you start with two vms first right the point is when you are plan when you are creating your virtual network you need to plan it out properly right plan properly what i mean by that is you need to create the subnets
we are by giving them sufficient width, right? I, range of IP, IP addresses, that is what subnets have, right? You have some 101.56. Dot, this, these are all subnets, right? You need to give proper ranges so that you have sufficient uh, sufficient vacancies of IPs to put the VMs over there. So if my subnet of this guy is starting from dot some 101 and then I have 256 addresses, so I can address, I can put 256 VMs. But if it is not, then I have to use the other bits also, right? So it's something like that. Uh, once you have the sufficient subnets, then the in a sufficient vacancy or IP addresses in single subnet, so WebTS subnet two gets used when when uh, for VM one and VM two. When you want to add three, all you have to got to do is create a VM. When you are creating the VM, assign this virtual network to this VM. By default, if you create a VM, it like we discussed and I demoed it to you also, it automatically creates a virtual network, right? But if there is already a virtual network, how do you add the VM to that particular virtual network, right? So it, I think, let's see how we can do it. But obviously, you will do it from a script. Like I said, never now do that from uh, a machine, right? So networking uh, from portal. So you can see, we can specify the virtual network, right? So I can, if I see it will list the uh, virtual networks in, um, if I change the resource group, hopefully it will list there. Now, let's see. Because the next step, right? Once you fill up this, it will go to the next step now. So as you can see, it picked up the virtual network because I selected this interbase two. So I can specify a virtual network where the machine will get created inside of that virtual network. So you, when you create that machine, when you create the third VM, make sure that you specify which virtual network this need to be part of. After that, there will be a way, I don't know how, there will be a way to put this inside the particular subnet also. Was it somewhere here? Yeah, subnet also is there, right? You, if you add the set of subnets, you can select the subnet from there. Manage subnet configuration, so everything can be done here. Uh, so you add it into this subnet, so this VM comes over here. Now all that is left is this connectivity part, right? So you need to update the load balancer with the third IP of this VM. And your VM is deployed, up and running. Nothing else you need to do. The rest of the system is automatically run. Now, imagine uh, e-commerce example, right? Very appropriate example of auto-scaling. Now, auto-scaling is not only about increasing the uh, capacity of your system, right? It also is decreasing, right? Remember the first up and down slide that we had uh, in that graph, right? So, um, we should write a template or, or we should, we should, when we, when we configure this in our assignment, we should actually take a next step that we should write a script in our Azure CLI, which will add a VM during the weekend to the web server. And from Monday morning, it will remove that VM from that and st stop it. Right. So it could be as simple as simply stopping the VM because, uh, you know, taking it out need not to be done. But if the if you stop the VM, it will still have its many other things still running, right? So you can actually create that VM in a in a in a resource group, and then delete the resource group. That it will completely remove that VM. If it is only one VM for a week, it won't cost you if you just simply stop the VM. But it might cost you more money if there the number of VMs are more, right? So it could make sense to delete the VM because it is not going to be used for five next five days, right? But at least um, we can write a script which can pull the VM out or stop the VM when the time comes when and start the VM when the time goes and have a static IP address so that load balancer, if we have this IP address here entered, and it's a static IP address, 
if the vm is down load balancer will not use it right it will know that it will ping it will keep pinging the vm so it will know that the vm is down so it will keep sending the request to the other two vms during the week friday evening my script runs brings this vm up load balancer ka starts coming to know because it now this vm is responding to the ping of the load balancer now it starts using that vm as part of the web tier so this is auto scaling scaling according to the expected demand okay um the it could be more sophisticated it need not to be time based right right what if there is a holiday uh, republic day 26th is a wednesday day so then i have to manually run the my run, run my script so can i make a script which is intelligent enough to automatically scale the uh, automatically add the vms or remove them based on the traffic that is coming right so if you see for example uh, if x plus y is the capacity of number of requests that these two vms can run these two vms can handle if this capacity comes to let's say 80% or 90% 90% saturation then i trigger my script which adds this vm right if it comes down to 50% or that uh, one number some number 40% let's say it removes this vms from the network right or shuts down the vm so these are the challenges that uh, people who are really interested in you know this this uh, subject can actually do it and try try to do it but uh, depends on your interest but it can be done okay you can build a system which automatically scales up and scales down based on such parameters could be um, anything but it could be it is a real parameter right live in incoming requests and mapping them to the capability of the existing system and taking a decision whether where you should add the um, add the capacity right in in business tier it could be about the processing power this vms are getting used because the messages that they are processing take are, are taking longer time so that the script should add the vm to the to the uh, business tier taking that into account right data based layer tier is not straight forward so we will leave it that there but web tier and business tier we can definitely um, look into okay so as you can see there are a lot of details it's a simple set of vms but a lot of details and all our previous knowledge like vms static ip address availability sets load balancer are coming into play together so that we can understand this architecture right so that is why uh, it is important to know the basic fundamentals in any subject so what we talked in the previous lectures we are now putting together that knowledge to to a, to a common one Uh, thing that we can make use of okay any questions on the stuff we discussed um regarding the assignments um i think one or two assignments are fine but submitting the assignments after due date is not going to uh, be evaluated because um we have to put a deadline right so if you say i i should allow one hour time or 10 hours time or one it never there is no way to decide which one is sufficient right so it will well very well be the time set by the google classroom itself so please don't submit after the deadline is over i'm fine with one or two assignments first two assignments but next time onwards now onwards if you want to submit assignment submit it well before time not afterwards even if it is one minute late is not going to be working out because uh, google classroom will cut cut off that and send us the notification that this assignment was submitted late when it was late submitted we don't have to worry about that part so there has to be one cut off line one minute here and there is not about uh, emotional question that sir ne ek minute ke liye allow nahi kiya it's not that you should submit it on time on or before time so one minute late is also late one day late is also late either ways it is not going to be evaluated so first two three assignments i am fine but next time onwards uh, you should submit it on time because i hope by that time you would have sorted out your 
uh, what do you say these accounts issues and stuff okay hello sir okay. makes sense and uh, if hello, you don't sir. have yeah sir can we do the assignments in a group um no i think because these assignments are not meant like project works and mostly are tutorials you can just follow it from the uh, network uh, net so why wh how will it will be advantages how it will be advantages sir so it will take the credits that's why i i, I am asking will take the credits we we have the 100 credits for the free account see it's not it need not to be your student account if anybody joins azure right they will have some free day, free trial 30 days trial stuff like that use that na you can create one two two three uh, ids and do it what is what is there Okay, sir. Okay. Because doing in group, what happens generally is one person will do it and others will simply copy it. Maybe you are doing it already. You Maybe you are copying it from others, but at least uh, uh, I will not be guilty that uh, I put you in groups and one only one or two guy, two students learned, the rest of them did not learn. So the idea will get defeated. But if you still copy that is not my responsibility if you want to copy and not learn that's your job I, I don't i don't mind but my job is to give you the right uh, framework and processes which do not encourage that right so that is the reason if we do a project or if we do a bigger assignment where it might be that grouping is required we will definitely allow it it's not a big issue i don't have qualms about people working in group in fact working in group is better many times because it it increases the team spirit communication things like that those are advantages are there but i think assignments are um, best to be done individually because i want each one of you to be hands on okay um, if you do it in group not everybody will be able to do it so assignments i will prefer Everybody does individually. Anything else? Okay, I think you have got two assignments. So in your lab time, you are supposed to do assignments. Uh, I am going to discuss with TAs how we can have a lab. I don't know how much it will be of help, but at some point or another, if, if we have assignments which are not directly from tutorials, etc., you will need help, right? So uh, the problem is who will help TA cannot I cannot stay for all the lab time so we'll have to figure it out if you have any suggestions let me know how we can make it better okay and again um, attendance is very low so that that should that is concerning if you are registering for a course please attend the lectures all right take care then guys bye